Hello, and welcome to Things We Said Today, our bi-weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles, both collectively and individually, past, present, and future when we hear about what it's going to be. Uh, I'm Alan Cozen, the author of The Beatles, From the Cavern to the Rooftop, and Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything, and uh, co-author with Adrian Sinclair of the forthcoming McCartney Legacy, Volume 1, um, forthcoming sometime next year. Um, I'm joined by my esteemed co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know is the host of the syndicated radio show, Every Little Thing. Uh, and also a co-host of the podcast, Talk More Talk. And he has his own YouTube channel where he puts on lots of Beatles-related interviews. Hello, Ken. How's it going? Good. Glad to be with you. Glad to be with you, Darren. Great topic. A very historic uh, event we'll be talking about this time. Yeah. And the other is Darren DeVivo, uh, DJ at WFUV 90.7 in the New York area. Uh, he's been broadcasting there since February 26, 1984. Um, so you've had ample opportunity to hear him. If you haven't yet, um, you can hear him and everything else at w that happens at WFUV at WFUV.org. And when we sign off at the end, he'll give you more details about other ways you can hear him. Darren, how's it going? How are you? Peace and love, everyone. Welcome to another Things We Said Today. Nice Met shirt. <laughs> yeah, well, they brought the black back, which I'm not necessarily a fan of. Uh, but when in Rome, and I was at the game this, uh, uh, I guess it would be this past Friday night, now that they're going to wear the old black uniforms, Friday nights at home for the rest of the year. So I was like, all right, I dug out the old black Mets uniform t-shirt so looks good on uh, you. with the uh hall of fame patch it's a mike piazza he's on the back so <laughs> hey, great he's not on the back but his name we still have to go to a mets game Dan. yes we do we do yeah Let's make cool. sure we do it this year okay so today, um, as Ken hinted, we're talking about um, a very historical concert that took place 50 years ago yesterday, uh, and that is the concert for Bangladesh, which um, I was lucky enough to actually attend uh, the evening show. And um, we'll get to that after Ken gives us the news. Ken? Okay. So here's what's happened in the last couple of weeks since our last show. A brand new video premiered uh, from Paul McCartney featuring Beck of the new version of his song, Find My Way, from the McCartney Three Imagined album. It features a young McCartney, circa 1965, dancing his way through the video, which was co-produced by Hyperreal Digital. This is a company that specializes in the creation of hyper-realistic digital avatars. The company's CEO, Remington Steele, says the technology to de-age talent and have them perform in creative environments like this is now fully realized, even with one of the most recognized faces in the world. I enjoyed the video. I thought it was uh, uh, pretty unique what they did there. Um, some people consider it kind of creepy. Paul trying to look like he did in 1965, although it was with this technology. Uh, there was a surprise ending. Uh, which I don't think we should mention in case anyone still hasn't seen the video. Do I you, either of you? What's I haven't that? seen it. Don't mention it. I okay. haven't seen it. Okay. Have you, Alan? I have. I thought it was an actor with the exception of one short segment where Paul made a cameo. Yeah, yes. Paul made a cameo a couple of seconds, like a, an Alfred Hitchcock move. Right. But um, they use some kind of special technology for this. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I don't know. It was kind of weird to see a 65, like out of help, <laughs> mm -hmm. help the movie, uh, Paul. Um, it's, but I think it was really interesting the way they ended it. So, mm -hmm. um, also as it has been for the last several years, John Lennon's iconic song, Imagine kicked off the summer Olympics this time with an arrangement from Hans Zimmer. 
led by a youth choir and singers joining in, including John Legend and Keith Urban. Last week, two major releases came out. The book, see if I can find it here. All Things Must Pass Away, Harrison and Clapton and Assorted Other Love Songs. It's by Ken Womack and Jason Krupa, who we're going to have on our show a um, few weeks from now. I think it's about a month from now. Um, and also McCartney 3 Imagined on CD and vinyl. Um, and the, um, it also came out in cassette, by the way. Uh, the vinyl and CD version has a bonus track with Idris Elba's version of Long-Tailed Winterbird. This is an interesting take on the song, which is, for the most part, an instrumental on Paul's recording. Idris singles and raps through the song, and uh, it sure does sound like Paul is harmonizing with him. There are special limited edition colored vinyl versions that have been made for McCartney, if you imagine. Target has a silver one, Barnes & Noble a blue one. There's an indie exclusive for independent record stores. That's a gold one. PaulMcCarty.com has a green one, a purple one, and a splatter one. And I'm told there are also blue and pink cassettes for the album. Okay, Jaws Martin is in the news. He spoke with Rolling Stone in which he said that while he's been busy these last few years overseeing, remixing and expanding uh, the expanded Beatle archival box sets of their later work, don't look for remixes for Rubber Soul and Revolver anytime soon. He says the technology isn't there. He's quoted as saying, how do I make sure that John or Paul's vocal isn't just in the right-hand speaker, but also make sure that his guitar doesn't follow him if I put it in the center? Martin spoke of uh, limitations of four-track recording and that studio performances blended onto a single track to take advantage of the limited tape space provided back then. On George Harrison's Taxman, for, for instance, the guitar, the bass, and drums are all on one track, he says. That's why the record is basically on the left-hand side, and then there's a shaker on the right-hand side of the center. Despite the constant requests I get on Twitter or whatever to do these albums, he says, I want to make sure that we can do a good job and do a beneficial job. You've got to make sure that you're doing these things at the right time for the technology. And Jaws has been busy updating the Dolby Atmos version for Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, which debuted on Apple Music in June. That mix was done as part of a theatrical presentation. Martin says he wants to adapt it for home and headphone listening. Any comments about this from uh, what Giles had to say? Well, there's going to be another Sergeant Pepper uh, reissue, it sounds like. <laughs> well, you know, uh, I find it interesting, all these remixes, but it, I wouldn't mind if the early catalog, if he just put out outtakes. I yeah. mean, one disc of outtakes for, the, for each of the early albums leading through Revolver, although I'm sure many fans would want more than that for Revolver or Rubber Soul. But are remixes that important? You know, I, I do think it's nice with updated technology to try to make it sound better, but I've always loved the Beatles recordings the way they were. Mm -hmm. So... Um, you know, I think the concern should should maybe be more about, about outtakes. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. surprising what he said, because um, there is an awful lot of consumer level technology available that people are making stereo versions of everything that was out in mono. Um, mm. You know, someone recently... Uh, well, there have been lots of people making stereo re remixes of the BBC things, for instance, but um, one guy who had done some of those and was, you know, trying to make a, a relatively nice sounding centered stereo mix, vocals in the center, instruments, you know, to the sides and, uh, mm. you know, and had done a good job, decided um, that it might be fun to make a remix the way the early Beatles albums were the first two. Um, and so did a bunch of BBC songs with the vocals on one channel and the instrumentals on the other channel. So if you can do that, you can do a lot of kind of separation. Um, so I'm not sure what it is that Giles is waiting for. Um, I, I, 
I, I respect his opinion about the technology more than my observations of what, you know, just people are able to do and post on the internet. Um, but, uh, you know, I think it may not be that far in the future that the technology reaches where he wants it to go. Yeah, I'm pretty sure um, that there have been some recordings that have floated around of um, the deck audition recordings mm -hmm. made in stereo. Somebody right. played around with it right. and it sounds pretty good. Mm -hmm. So there has to be a way of isolating some of these tracks, even if they're combined with other instruments on the same track. And right. if you can do that, you can do just about anything. That's right. Yeah. You know, so, and you can. look, if you can take the voices out of a BBC recording and present the instruments on one side and the voices on another, you can do a lot of separating. Um, right. It would seem to me. But so I don't think it'll be that long. Um, but it's interesting that he's saying so and, uh, you know, giving that as a as a reason. Um, it then raises the question of what will happen with the first two albums where it's just twin track uh, and all he has is all the instruments and all the vocals. I mean, they tried a bit on uh, Beatles rock band in 2009 to get more separations than were on the master tapes and uh, it succeeded, but there were, there were, you know, audible artifacts. And I think he doesn't want to put out a remix where you can hear artifacts because that would be uh, semi-pro, you know what I mean? Hmm. Okay. Well, we shall see. Uh, the latest issue of guitar player is out and it's a 50th anniversary issue with material on the concert for Bangladesh also exploring the gear the Beatles used during the Let It Be sessions. Of course, we all know the big day is this Friday for the new archival box set for All Things Must Pass, and the next show that we do here on Things We Said Today will be covering just that. Uh, a new live Weaklings album is coming out September the 17th called In Their Own Right, little play there on the John Lennon book. There's a pre-sale for the album on their website, weeklings.com. That's W-E-E-K-L-I-N-G-S.com. Every advance order will receive a bonus track for the song Mona Lisa. All advance orders will ship out on September the 1st. There's also a new Splinter live album, Live in England, which is coming out. Uh, that's on September the 15th. The live recordings date back from 1974 through 77. Very interesting. Uh, the George Harrison tribute, formerly known as Harry Fest, will be returning as a one-day event on a date we should all, it's easy to remember, October the 9th, at White's in Westport, Massachusetts. Unless the COVID situation continues to get worse, hopefully, this will happen. If you want to keep up to date with the latest information on this festival, you can visit their Facebook page, George Harrison Tribute, formerly Harry Fest. And that, uh, that'll feature lots of tribute artists for the Beatles with a bit more of a focus on George. And lastly, August 1st is a special day for Beatle fans, not just because of the anniversary of the concert for Bangladesh, but it's also... It was Danny Harrison's birthday, and uh, Danny turned 43. Very happy birthday to you there, Danny. Yeah. And we all know that he's going to be very consumed with all the forthcoming Harrison archival releases, which at least based on what we learned in a press release right before COVID, that there are plans for recordings through 1974 for some things to come out possibly i hope the 74 tour hmm. but anyway that's it for beetle news let's get to another live event concerning okay. george harrison on this show um, so we're going to talk about the concert for bangladesh which has gone down in history as the first of the charitable 
rock events uh, that led to you know Live Aid and the second Live Aid and, and lots of other concerts like that that have raised funds for uh, you know, global charitable causes um, and probably also set the stage for a lot of the rumors in the 1970s about how the Beatles were going to get together to play a charity concert for the UN and uh, there were lots of plans floated like that um, but this one was real and it actually happened and um, uh, I don't know to commemorate yesterday uh, I watched the uh, two set two DVD set of the concert and uh, it was nice seeing it again uh, haven't watched it for a while um, plus there are a couple of outtake performances and um, uh, rehearsal performances, like If Not For You and Come On In My Kitchen. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Uh, Ken, what are your memories of it? Of the, con are you just of the audio of it or because I wasn't there. I know, but you, you mean remember after watching happened, like, like it happening and hearing about it and, and all of that. I heard about it vaguely on the radio, huh. but that was about it. I kind of waited for for the album to come out the live album i was very curious about it i had already loved all things must pass mm -hmm. and i remember the single for bangladesh coming out but i don't remember too much about reports about it at the time really so uh, yeah okay i was, I was still still a youngster back then right, Alan. right. <laughs> I think Aaron was even more of a youngster so do, do you have any that's true yes, i was and some say i still am <laughs> i i I, I, the only memory I have, I do have faint memories of hearing the song Bangladesh on the radio. Uh -huh. And uh, I always liked it. And um, it might have been, it wasn't the first, but it might have been one of the first, it was one of the first singles of George's that I bought. Uh, I liked the song so much from hearing it, the little I heard it in 1971. Uh, it really wasn't until the film would start popping up here and there or, or you or, or VHS that, you know, I really um, got to know, as, you know, somewhat inside and out what the show was about. But uh, no, that was one of the things that passed me by. And um, it's interesting to think that before Bangladesh, uh, there weren't any of these high profile charity concerts. If there were not ones that, uh, you know, got written in history books right. um, and that George uh, co-organized this thing uh, was pretty cool. Today we take these type events for granted. They happen fairly common before the pandemic. I mean, between regularly scheduled yearly festivals and charity concerts. Now we have the big New York city uh, week of events coming up in August. Um, you know, those type things were rare back then. And when you tied in, uh, you know, as being a benefit of charity, uh, totally unique today. It happens pretty often. So, yeah. Um, um, yeah, so I unfortunately don't have, mine was all, you know, reading about it after the fact so, about the show, who was there watching the movie, you know, and, uh, you know, getting the album. I do, I do remember getting the album was one of the great finds uh, for me as a music collector, a record collector. I never owned the album until the mid eighties. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was in a, in a record store, an independent store uh, in Yonkers. Uh, Mad Platters was the, was the name of the store. And they had um, a sealed copy and it looked like it was in, it was brand new. Mm -hmm. And I bought it fully expecting when I got it home, I, I don't even actually think I gave it any thought that I, that I found myself an Apple here um i figured it would be whatever the last pressing capital put out or whatever the case might be but much to my amazement it was a pristine brand new apple pressing with all the inserts everything intact uh -huh. and um nice. <laughs> so th that's like one of my memories was getting a copy of the album some 15 years after the fact and getting a pretty collectible somewhat collectible version Okay. I could tell you, um, you know, I bought the live album probably a few months after it was released. And I remember 
because I was never really big on live albums early on until maybe Wings Over America, which is probably my favorite live album of all time. But being very overwhelmed by it all, the fact that, you know, All Things Was Passed was a triple album. Right. And then he follows that with another triple album, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, I listened to it quite a bit. And like most young people avoided the Indian music, but um, I loved, I loved the other stuff that I heard and it's, it's, it's a live album and watching it on DVD. You really go to appreciate it more and more through the years. Mm-hmm. I love it as a live performance now, but uh, I was too young to really appreciate what was going on right. back then. I mean, I think after I really started to learn what the concert was about, how it was put on, who was in it, the cause. So um, I guess as the class geezer, um, it's up to me to do the uh, more historical uh, overview of the time. Um, I I went to it, as I said, as I said, um, but, you know, like this was uh, long before my music critic days. I think I was like 16. Um, and I had a friend who, uh, made a habit of going to Mount down to Madison square garden or the film or wherever it is and like sleeping online to get tickets. Um, and he always did a pretty good job in this case, you know, we didn't get like right down in front or anything. We were up in the green section, which was you know, sort of up the side a bit, but quite a good view of everything that was happening. Um, I almost ended up not going um, because I'd been sick the whole week before and the day of Bangladesh, I still had like 104 fever and my parents got a a doctor in. They used to do these things called house calls back in the day. Um, And, you know, he examined me and, uh, you know, I'm saying, look, I've got this thing I got to go to tonight in the city. And uh, uh, there's no way I'm not going because all four Beatles and Dylan are going to be there. Um, And, you know, and this was just perspective. I mean, I hadn't heard any reports of the afternoon show, but in those days, anytime there was a big event, it was assumed that Dylan would show up and he never, ever did except this time. Um, And, uh, you know, it was just also a guess that all the Beatles would be there. Uh, And my doctor said, well, you know, look, I really think you should stay home. If it was something important, like a basketball game, I could see you going, but you know, not for this. And I was able to use that logic to persuade my parents that if it was okay for me to go to a basketball game, it was going to be okay for me to go to the concert. Uh, And as the final medical footnote here, um, after the concert, when I got home, no more fever at all. So I can say it was cured by seeing two of the Beatles. Um, but anyway, you know, we went and uh, it was, you know, it was really kind of a, a very electric atmosphere. Um, I had not ever seen any Beatles live before. Um, and now there were going to be at least two because um, it was known that Ringo was going to play. Um, and we had by then, by the time we got there, we had heard reports of the afternoon show. So we knew that Dylan actually had shown up at least for the afternoon show. Um, so, uh, you know, we, I remember the, um, Indian set. I remember George coming out and introducing it. I remember them tuning and everybody applauding and thinking, um, that's just tuning, isn't it? And, you know, and, and Robbie said, if you, if you enjoy the tuning so much, I hope you enjoy the music. Um, right. And, uh, you know, and then George came out and uh, with the whole band, with, you know, we've got Leon Russell and Billy Preston and the guys from Badfinger and lots of singers and lots of um, brass players uh, Ringo and Jim Keltner, uh, the stage was absolutely packed. I mean, it looked, uh, you know, you you can get a sense of this from the video, but live, it really looked like a mess in a way. Like how does everybody know who to look at for cues and, and, and all that stuff? Because there were a gazillion people there. Um, Hmm. and you know, they started playing and it just, uh, you know, we know the concert 
um, from the record and the film. And uh, that was pretty much the feeling. It was a uh, very good sound. I um, accidentally taped it. Uh, so I didn't have to wait that long for the record to come out. I mean, once the record came out, I never bothered listening to the tape again because they did a better job than I did. Um, mm. But it was nice being able to like, you know, the next day, uh, the, the, my two other friends and I who went to the concert got together again and listened to it and talked about it. So that was kind of fun. Um, but, you know, I mean, it was really, uh, it was wild when Dylan came out and, uh, you know, the place sort of, you know, erupted. Um, and, uh, you know, he played a short set and then left. I mean, and that was a little bit different from the rest of the players, you know, everybody else, you know, Leon got a solo spot, Billy Preston got a solo spot, Ringo sang, um, but everybody was still in the band playing, but Dylan was the only one who really sort of, you know, came and went. Um, hmm. And, you know, we remember, I remember, uh, you know, watching Eric Clapton play while my guitar gently weeps and thinking, um, you know, the record sounded a bit better, but we, you know, we now know, that uh, what we hear on the record is a lot of um, sort of processing that happened after the fact. Um, and, uh, you know, but it was still a good solo. He seemed to be in good shape, but, you know, I think we subsequently learned that he wasn't in the greatest shape at that time um, and barely, uh, barely made it, you know, they, uh, in the thing, in the DVD, I was watching yesterday, there was an interview with George saying that, that he, they had booked him like on flights for like seven days straight and he never turned up. And finally they got Jesse Ed Davis in and sent word to Eric that he didn't have to come. And he said, no, I'm coming. And he came and, uh, you know, um, my feeling, it, it, it's interesting. You know, I've read a lot of comments um, yesterday on, on Facebook. A lot of people posted about the concert and some said it was the, most incredible show they ever saw. I can't really say that. I mean, even at the time, I know that I, I think maybe I think it more now than I did then. At the time, I hadn't been to an awful lot of concerts. Um, I was 16, but I had seen the Jimi Hendrix experience. I'd seen the Stones. I'd seen the Who. Um, I'd seen some pretty good stuff. And my feeling coming out of that show, I remember, you know, what we talked about. And I remember saying, you know, it, it's kind of the starriest show I've ever seen. And it was great. I would definitely not want to have missed it. Um, but I'm not sure that in musical terms, it was the best show I'd ever seen because, you know, the Hendrix and the Who and the Stones all had, you know, tightly rehearsed shows. And this was clearly ad hoc, you know, everyone had come together and was doing this. And in a way it was miraculous that it went off as well as it did. You know, there are a couple of places where people miss a lyric here and there, um, particularly George, um, since he did most of the singing. Um, but there were no kind of train wrecks or missed cues or, or anything. The songs went, you know, start to finish without, um, without really any recognizable incident. So, you know, musically, it really was pretty good. And I think hearing it again yesterday, I, I, I thought, you know, I don't, I don't know why I thought this, you know, wasn't as good as the 1969 Stones concert, which I would barely remember if not forget your yayas out, you know? Um, and, uh, so yeah, that was that was the experience. I mean, it, it was just electrifying to be there. Um, there was a, a real sense of excitement. Um, it was incredible, you know, seeing George fronting a band. I mean, if you know, as someone who had followed, you know, every second of the Beatles um, while they were together, the idea of George fronting a band is something that never even occurred to me as a possibility. Mm. Um, although, you know, all things must pass. Uh, you know, did, uh, I think, let people know that there was a lot more there than we knew. Um, so, you know, that, those, are, those are my memories of it. You know, it's, it's very interesting what you just said that, about George and the whole idea of being a front guy, because I, I heard a clip where George is saying, I never wanted to be the front guy. I never wanted to be 
the guy in the white suit <laughs> up front, and here he is in a white suit in this concert. Yeah. But uh, but this really is George at his shining moment live, to me anyway, because he likes the camaraderie of working with a lot of musicians that he admires, mm -hmm. and so he made sure that. Billy Preston got a number, Leon Russell got a number, Bob Dylan had a set, Ringo had a number. It wasn't all just on George. And of course, Ravi Shankar led the concert. So this is what George was more all about. You know, he liked being part of a group, not necessarily the leader. And yet this was his show that he put together, you know, with Ravi Shankar. Um, so it, it's an amazing it's an amazing show and, and in a way once you learn the history of what happened and the fact that you know he really started working on this in june and in two months he put this together he didn't know if dylan was going to show up to the last minute right um they didn't know if eric clapton was going to be there at the last minute and yet somehow they pulled it all together and the real reason why is because you're dealing with such exceptional musicians eric clapton at the time was supposed to have had a really bad heroin problem mm -hmm. and yet you know he's on stage and you'd never really know it from his playing right <laughs> so these people are so talented leon russell was a studio musician for many years they could perform some of this stuff with little rehearsal at all mm -hmm. they can do a lot of this in in their sleep Right. And, you know, and Captain was on All Things Must Pass, so he knew that stuff, too, which was a lot of what George played. Right. No, but uh, it's really a remarkable thing to watch. It's such an enjoyable show. And one interesting thing, when the, the DVD came out, this was 2005, I think, um, there was a screening in New York City that I attended, and I got the chance to interview Olivia Harrison for a few minutes. And I was thinking to myself, you know, they didn't know Dylan was going to show up. They didn't know Clapton was going to show up. Was there any backup plan just in case they didn't? And she said to me, no. <laughs> so we could have had a much shorter show. Mm -hmm. And yet I've read at the same time that when George was sketching out his ideas for this concert, originally he was thinking about doing All Things Must Pass with Leon Russell. So I guess they would have shared lead vocals mm. um art of dying was a song that he was considering doing um yeah so we could have had other songs had they rehearsed it but they evidently didn't and once they knew dylan was in there he had to have his set so there was enough material to fill up the time especially with the indian music so they had a full show that way mm -hmm. but at the same time um with all that talent, my, my only real criticism, if there is any, you got Eric Clapton there. <laughs> it would have been great for him to do one of his songs. Mm -hmm. He had Badfinger there, you know, and that was at a time when they had hits already. Yeah. Um, and George was producing them. So that would have been nice. But the whole thing, they only had a week to rehearse. And Dylan and Clapton didn't show up till the end. Mm -hmm. So, you know, everything was done pretty quickly, but what they pulled off was pretty darn good. Mm -hmm. I had actually written down a couple of questions, and the first one I wrote was exactly what you just uh, brought up, Ken, was mm -hmm. that, you know, I wonder what kind of contingency plan they had, if any, mm -hmm. if Dylan didn't show up. Uh, now, I think we know this. I don't, off the top of my head, I don't recall... When the show began, the two shows, 2.30 in the afternoon, matinee, and 8 o'clock, uh, especially for the 2.30 show, I would like to think that as they first walked out on stage, they knew Dylan was in the house. Or did they not? Did he appear, arrive, like, after the first show began, and it was like a, hey, George, he's here, you know, mm. from, the, from, the, from the rafters. No, because they could have footage with him. Right. All right. So they 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 didn't really need to have a backup plan because they knew Dylan was going to be there. The musicians right. did at least. Yeah. Um, and as for uh, what you you what you said, Ken, about Eric Clapton, everything again. And I'm looking forward to Ken Womack's book, the new mm -hmm. book coming out. 
uh, which I did just get, but I haven't had a chance to, to open it up yet. Um, I got the impression that Clapton was in no, no, no condition to actually take the mic and do, do a song and come out, of, out front, you know, and do a tune. Because it, and if you watch the movie, it really does seem like he's making a concerted effort to stay out of the spotlight and away from the camera. You know, so much of that, if you're not watching, you know, ever hanging on every minute of the film, um, you can go lengthy periods of time not even seeing Eric Clapton on camera. Right. Um, so, but what I want to ask Alan was the buzz leading up to the concert, which I guess uh, today it, the, the rumor mill is like an industry in itself. But in 1971, you were going by the few publications. There were music publications, maybe a DJ uh, leaking a story or something. Um, now, I know that there had been talk and there was a ru rumors going around that John Lennon could very well appear. Right. That was a possibility. It apparently and, was a possibility, yeah. Uh, but was it with McCartney too? McCartney was asked, um, and I think that never was a real possibility. Um, um, I think he talked about considering it briefly because it's, 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 you know, you don't want to be the one to say no to a, a big charitable thing like this. But on the other hand, he didn't want to, he didn't want to be part of a Beatles reunion, which it would have been, you know, if he and John had shown up and, and he was still probably, you know, smarting a bit from, uh, you know, the recent battles or as, as the Southerners would say, the recent unpleasantness, the late unpleasantness. Um, as a fan at 16 years of age, going in to that Sunday and that show, I mean, you were hoping that all three of them would join George, right? Yeah. That yeah. was still a rumored possibility as far as the fans. Definitely. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, and we found out after the fact that, like you just said, it really didn't come close with McCartney. It did, though, with John, did it not? Right. Now, John has two stories about why it didn't. Um, one was that he started talking to George about what he and Yoko would do on stage, and George said, um, you know, not the Yoko part. <laughs> you know, you, you're <laughs> welcome on stage, um, but just you. And from John's point of view, that made it a non-starter. Um, John's other story, and, and they both may be true, um, was that they had to hightail it down to the Caribbean because the latest report that they had, uh, you know, they were chasing after Kyoko, Yoko's daughter. And the latest report they had was that Tony Cox, uh, Kyoko's father, and Kyoko were down there. So they had to get down there and therefore weren't able to even attend the show. Um, so I don't know which is more accurate. Uh, maybe they're both accurate, um, but but those are the two things that he uh, the, that John himself said about why he didn't go to Bangladesh. And of course, you were hoping Bob Dylan would be there, but by the time you got to the garden, you probably knew that Bob was at least going to be in the building because he had performed earlier. Right. Were there any other artists that we don't talk about today that were rumors rumored to be? possibilities do you remember not that i can think of um you know i'm not even sure that you know i mean regardless of all the bands that i really loved at that time i'm not sure that i would have really even focused on anyone other than the beatles and dylan as you know potentially being there i mean we knew that george and dylan had had a friendship going too um which is probably why Dylan would have gotten into the, the rumor mill, um, you know, not to mention that he did uh, a couple of Dylan songs on All Things Must Pass, uh, if not for you, and then the collaboration, I'd have you anytime. Um, so that seemed likely. And then we heard that it, it did indeed happen at the, uh, at the afternoon show. So that was something to be excited about on the subway on the way to the show. <laughs> Um, I think, I think in the same report that said that Dylan showed up, it, they would have also said that the other Beatles, apart from Ringo, did not show up. So we probably knew that walking into Madison Square Garden, too. Um, 
but still it was um it was something it you know it was something to be hoped for and uh you know even though i i don't remember being intensely disappointed that they didn't mm-hmm. because it was just something we were hoping it wasn't uh it wasn't something we were promised you know we were promised george you know and probably ringo and then we knew it was going to be dylan uh i'm not sure what else we knew about who was going to be there but uh i don't remember any other rumors did they say did they say clapton i'm not sure and how about the others like oh leon russell i heard was going to be part of the show or they said billy preston would play keyboards in the house band yeah. were those rumors out there were those not rumors were those facts out there at the time um, you know, they might have been. I, I don't really remember um, because I wouldn't have been that excited about necessarily either one of them. I mean, I, I had that's the way God planned it. And, uh, you know, obviously knew Billy Preston's association on Get Back and um, and Leon Russell. Uh, you know, I liked, uh, you know, Joe Cocker and the stuff he was doing that Leon Russell was doing with him. But it wouldn't have really been either exciting or not exciting it just was okay you know that that sounds good um so i don't remember focusing on any of those or whether they were even really reported i i imagine that in the uh you know whatever radio report i heard about the afternoon show they probably would have mentioned everybody you know big who was in the band um so we probably knew getting on to the subway who was going to be there. Um, but in a, in a way it didn't matter. We just knew that George was assembling some kind of a super band. We, we, I mean, we knew it wasn't going to be just George and a couple of other people. We knew there were going to be a lot of people there. So we probably knew Eric. We probably knew uh, Leon Russell and Billy Preston, but I just don't remember, you know, thinking about them in advance particularly much. But you did hear a lot of rumors in the media about a, Beatle, a Beatles reunion. I don't know um, if there were a lot. Um, I think it was just something that, you know, a DJ might say, you know, maybe uh, John and Paul will be there and uh, this, you know, and and it could have also just been us, you know? And when I say us, I mean, probably everybody else that was in the building that night probably had hoped that that would happen, you know, just because look, you, you got a special show, you got two Beatles, committed to be turning up um you know it just seemed logical to assume that maybe the others might come um Mm -hmm. have no idea i mean i can't even imagine what it would have been like if they did um all i can say is that uh i don't think it would have been like a mid-60s beatles show you know because by then you know when the stones came in 1969 i think they basically proved that audiences had grown up and we're not going to sit there and scream all through a concert because, you know, in the last time the stones were in the U S in 66, that's what happened. It was just like the Beatles, you know, and stones came out, all the girls screamed, no one could hear much. And that was it. They came in 69, they played a show and, you know, people were quiet when they were playing, you know, good responses after each song, but, You know, and and so it gave you some hope. You know, you began to think, okay, maybe the other Beatles would have heard that this is the case and that they could play a concert that people would listen to. And, you know, maybe Paul could play some of his stuff um, from the McCartney album. And, um, uh, you know, John, I guess Ram was out by then too. He could do that, do something from that. and, And John... Classic Ono band, I mean, maybe Imagine. Um, I think Imagine. Yeah, how do you see yet? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but it would have been cool to hear some <laughs> tracks. Uh, you know, Ringo had some hits already, one of which he sang. Uh, so you know, it, it, it really had. You know, if you if you wanted to let your fantasy go wild, uh, it it had a lot of possibilities. Mm. And seeing as I been in bed with a fever all week, my fantasy was going nuts, you know? <laughs> mm. So, yeah. Could you, um, from your seat, could you see Badfinger? 
Yeah, I could see everything. They it, were out. They weren't like tucked away in the you know in the in the dark on side of the stage. They were out in the no. They were there. In the spotlight. Not really in the spotlight, but you could see everybody on the stage. So you know that would include them. Um, didn't think that much about them being Badfinger. Um, I just really probably saw them as a bunch of acoustic guitar players, you know, because he introduced them. But as Ken said, you know, it, they could have sang something. That would have been nice. You know, and then after it, um, you know, in the press conference beforehand, George had talked about how he thought maybe the LP version could be out within a week or a few days. Mm. Um and as you know, it, it, it took quite a bit longer than that. And um, there were hassles about how the money was going to be distributed and whether there were going to be uh, issues because Dylan was a Columbia artist and Leon Russell was a shelter artist and George was Apple. And, you know, there were, there were quite a lot of things to be straightened out. Um, and a little bit of that is in the documentary that comes with the DVD now. Um, and there, there are some contradictions that are raised. Uh, Bashkar Menon says, well, you know, Columbia objected. They thought it should, Clive Davis wanted it out on Columbia and we wanted it out, you know, through us. And, but then there's a, a, a cut to uh, George's Dick Cavett interview where he said, you know, Columbia was cool with it and everybody else was cool with it. It was just our label EMI that was a problem. Um, so, I remember, you know, Rolling Stone coming out with a big report about the, you know, the problems and the money and Alan Klein was a little involved in that too. And uh, uh, there was really sort of a feeling that, you know, this was a, a really good charitable event that, you know, was being in a way derailed, you know, those people needed the help um, and yet the money was being held up. And uh, I remember that being kind of a cloud over the whole thing. Um, another thing um, that I happened to notice um, on my little tape of the show, um, Clapton's slide guitar in the beginning of My Sweet Lord was a little bit sour, let's say, you know, ever so slightly out of tune. Um, so I think one of the reasons the record might have taken so long is that people had to come in and do a little bit of fixing as often happens on live albums. Um, because when you watch the film or listen to the record, the guitar on My Sweet Lord is just perfectly in tune. Um, so something was fixed. Um, and I don't know, I mean, presumably there were other things too, nothing that I noticed. Um, so I, I can't say what they would have been, but, you know, there might've been some other fixes too. Um, because also when it comes down to it, you're putting out a live album, it's a charitable album, but you also don't want to look bad on the release. Sure. that's going to be there for years to come. Um, so, you know, that might've contributed a little bit to the delay just because of, um, people's schedules, you know, when can someone get back into the studio to fix something and, uh, um, and then you got Spectre producing it. Um, so that probably also added a certain amount of time, um, whatever Spectre was up to in these mixes. So, Do you still yeah. have your tape? Of course. The cassette, you still have that? I, I don't have the cassette itself. I had um, transferred it to an open reel, and I still have that. And I have a CD version of it. <laughs> and Alan is in the process of starting up Cozen Records right now, and it'll be out on a track and cassette. Uh, no, not really. <laughs> you don't want my version if you can get the album. I can tell you. Yeah. You um, know, you were, you were talking about the money problem. Sorry, Darren. No, no. Um, but I heard that Alan Klein failed to register this concert as being a benefit for UNICEF. So, because of that. Um, they were denied tax exempt status yeah. and that was a problem too. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there were a lot of problems, but there are going to be in something that is this complicated and was arranged that quickly. And George was doing it, you know, largely on his own. I mean, Klein was supposed to be helping with that kind of stuff, but if that, if that's true, then he obviously dropped the ball. Um, 
But, you know, the way George talked about it is um, he just sort of got out his little black book and started calling all of his friends and asking if, you know, who could come. And, uh, you know, and that included John and Paul. Um, you know, and he, he managed to line up a, a pretty rocking band, you know, and with the brass and everything, uh, you know, he didn't skimp. Well, apparently no one got paid. So it wasn't really a question of skimping in any mm. case, but, it, but, it, but let's say he brought a pretty grand vision to the, to the whole process. But you were mentioning before the problems between um, Capitol and, and Columbia mm -hmm. and the album itself on cassette was released on CBS. Really? I didn't know. Yeah. Hmm. So I was always my understanding that's because Dylan was on the label. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that would so have been the accommodation they made. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. So it just had a regular Columbia logo on it. It didn't have the emaciated kid that was on the label of the. LP. I don't own a copy, so I'm, I'm not sure. I pretty, I think it had the same cover as the album. Mm -hmm. Right. I just know the cassette was on CBS. Interesting. So. I guess um, I know I can find one. <laughs> <laughs> now being that the idea of the show was to raise money, um, was there merchandise? There was You're not. Yeah, these were the days before groups got the merchandising thing together. You know, you would go to a concert and, it, you know, it could be the Stones, it could be this, it could be anything. And there'd be people outside hawking T-shirts, um, but they were unofficial. And, uh, no, you know, the bands themselves were not making any money. I don't think they got the merchandising thing together until probably the late seventies at best, but in 1971, there was nothing like that. There were no program books. There were, there was really nothing. You know, you know the um, story of the Woodstock uh, programs. Mm. Because th there were programs at right the Woodstock festival. Problem was they couldn't get the deliveries through in time. So it's pretty easy to find nice copy copies of the, the original Woodstock programs. I have two of them mm -hmm. uh, in like that are like in pretty nice shape because they never arrived at the site, which hearing that I'm thinking, all right, so some sense of merchandise was probably, you know, going on at that time. Yeah. Maybe they didn't have enough time to even print up shirts, you know, to raise additional money being that the concert was put together so quickly. Right. Yeah, you would think. Um, I didn't see anything, and I would have bought stuff if if uh, if I did. But mm -hmm. um, I, I didn't see anything like that, and and it it wasn't typical at the shows I went to back in those days. So um, if they did it at Woodstock, I, I wonder whether they, whether they were to be sold or you know handed out like a program book in a you know a regular. Well it's the size of the type of program that you'd spend $25, $35 on today. Wow. Um, so it was probably going to be sold. I can't imagine anyone's copies surviving uh, <laughs> the whole weekend, but mm. um, your recollection of the length of the show. Uh, we have the movie, we have the album, we have the reissue uh, with the additional material, the reissues. You still don't get an accurate sense of, you know, how long the show actually was. Did they go off on time at eight o'clock? And when do you recall, when did it end? I don't really recall, but um, I know that when I transferred my tape to uh, CD, it, it, it took two CDs. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that the length of the album and the length of the film is pretty much what the length of the show was. I mean, there were, there were not long long setup periods in between songs or anything like that. It, it really flowed the way it does on the record and, and in the film. Mm -hmm. so I don't think there was that much distinction. I'm pretty sure it started basically on time at eight. Um, don't remember when it was over. Um, but I, I think the timing of, of the released versions is pretty much what it is. I could, I could go get the timing on my tape and see what it, what it was and how it compares, but uh, 
I didn't tape Ravi Shankar, though, I don't think. What was the reaction uh, in the audience? Um, you hear polite applause and polite reception uh, on the recording. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I would imagine in some of the upper decks of Madison Square Garden, not everybody sat attentively uh, yeah, to what was a rather lengthy. Yeah. Set. I think there was probably some talking through that. Um, um, and there was, like you say, polite applause. I mean, you know, people didn't know a lot about Indian music. And, uh, you know, most, I, I would say that a lot of, a, a huge percentage of the people there, probably what they knew about Indian music was what they got from, you know, Within You, Without You, and uh, some of George's other things. Uh, um, you know, there, there was the beginning of some interest in Indian music out in the world, you know, possibly you could say it was because of George, but it, it wasn't to do with George. I mean, you know, uh, Vanguard, I think, was putting out some Ravi Shankar albums and, uh, and, and they were out there and you, you knew who Ravi Shankar was because George had talked about him during the Beatles years. You knew that he was considered the guy. Uh, and, you know, I think, uh, I had a friend with some Ravi Shankar albums actually, um, and had listened to some, um, which is why probably why I knew that the tuning up wasn't a piece. <laughs> um, but, uh, and you know, Hey, it didn't, it came in in less than half an hour. I mean, you know, come on. Um, but I think most people were just sort of politely listening and waiting for, um, George and friends to come out. And that must be really hard for Ravi Shankar, you know. Um, I, I talked to him about that once, actually. Um, you know, I, I asked him, you know, what, what was it like? I mean, given what you do and, you know, how it is received in India and in standard concerts, um, you know, wasn't it kind of difficult for you to turn up at something like Bangladesh and something like Monterey Pop? Um, and play in that context where people are not listening. And as you, you know, you heard probably on the album and in the film, the first thing he asks them is to not smoke um, mm. while he's playing. And, uh, you know, it, it did, he did say that, you know, it did bother him that people would be getting high listening to this music. Um, and that was a pretty typical Western slash hippie reaction to Indian music because it's instrumental, it's improvised. Um, there is nevertheless a lot of, you know, identifiable give and take between instruments, dialogues, things like that. And if you get high, uh, you know, that could, um, you know, just sort of be its own kind of happening. And, um, but he didn't want it to be perceived that way. I mean, you know, if, from an Indian perspective, um, this is essentially religious music, you know, even when it's on, as, as he said, the first piece he played was a, a Bangladeshi folk tune. Um, but, but the whole act of making that music was a, a sort of a, a sacred slash religious thing. Um, so you don't want people sitting there, you know, chatting through it and getting high and, uh, and all the things that happen at rock concerts. So for, from Ravi's point of view, it was sort of like, uh, you know, almost like a deal with the devil, you know, um, it meant putting up with those kind of things, but it also meant getting his music out to a larger crowd, some of whom might take to it and start listening. I mean, you know, I did after that, you know, not necessarily because of seeing him, but I ended up listening to an awful lot of Indian music over the years. And so I'm sort of glad I saw him when I did uh, and knew something about what his attitudes towards the music he was making was. Um, yeah, I mean, it would be really great to, you know, to experience that live again, you know, um, see whether the attitudes generally towards Ravi would have changed and, uh, you know, hear that concert again. Well, I mean, you can on the DVD, so, um, which has a surround mix. 
Well, uh, I can tell you, I've mentioned this before, but there is a band from Long Island called Wondrous Stories. And every single year they put on a concert, the concert for Bangladesh Revisited. Cool. And they usually do something for Ravi, but they don't play anything as complicated as Bangla done. You know, they'll, um, one year they had John Murjavi from the Weaklings, and he's also in Liverpool. He's their George Harrison guy. And he came out with a sitar, and he did, um, I think it was Within You, Without You, you know, as a substitute. Or Love You Too, one or the other. So they have Indian music represented in some way, mm -hmm. but they cover everything else. Ringo, Dylan, Leon Russell, Billy Preston, it's all covered in this concert. So that's a way that you can, you know, listen to this concert, watch this concert again and hear it mm. with other musicians doing it and showing their respect for this, for this show. So, and it's one of the greatest concerts I've been to because they really are excellent musicians. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was a good show. You know, the, it was a good set list, you know? I mean, if you, if you look right down it, I mean, he didn't, uh, so he didn't do Tax Man. He didn't, you'd, you'd have to wait for the, you know, basically the 1991 tour to hear uh, a lot of his Beatles favorites that, uh, hmm. you know, you might have wanted to hear then. But it was, um, you know, it was basically the new stuff. Um, something in Here Comes the Sun where, you know, sort of the, the nods to the Beatles. Although, you know, I didn't know it at the time, but Leon's young blood was too, in a way. You know, the Beatles used to do that when they were younger. And, uh, and George sang some of the backing vocals in the, yeah. uh, in the show. Um, so I guess, you know, even, even after the fact, you learn more Beatles connections. <laughs> I was going to say it really was a well-paced show the way how, how he plays certain songs where he did very smart to put Ravi Shankar at the beginning. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't want to put him in the middle of the show and you know, the audience is real into it. And then all of a sudden there's Indian music. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, a few George songs, then you cut to Ringo back to George. Then you go to Billy Preston back to George. Then you go to Leon, George, Dylan, <laughs> you know, and uh, it really flowed that way. You know, in a certain way it was the, um, the pattern for Ringo's all-star band. Mm. Yeah. yeah. True. And uh, no encore. Right. Right. No. Well, the way, the way it looks on the film is that he leaves after something and then comes out again to play Bangladesh. I don't remember it being that way. So maybe that was the way it was in the afternoon show. It could be what they were showing, you know, was the afternoon. Um, but yeah, I, I don't remember him leaving and coming back. I, I just remember it is all one concert. Mm -hmm. You know, when you watch the DVD, there's a lot of highlights for me. I mean, obviously the best thing about this concert is the band itself. Cause they're all great musicians, but there are those moments when the camera is on Ringo and Jim Keltner drumming together and they are so in step with each other. They're like locked in and it's yep. so much fun to see Ringo and Jim like that and enjoying each other, mm -hmm. you know, backing up uh, the songs when they did. Um, yeah, that's a real high moment for me. And I love, I'm a big fan of duets and I loved when, when George and Leon did Beware of Darkness. Um, and of course, Leon covered the song himself mm -hmm. right. on his own. So, and if it's true that George had thought about doing all things must pass with Leon, that would have been, that would have been something. Mm -hmm. He yeah, also, it, apparently, it, when I was reading about him sketching out ideas, he was thinking about Eric doing Let It Rain. Mm -hmm. wow. So he was, you know, considering having Eric do a song. So. It could be that Eric didn't want to. I mean, in, one, in the interview in the documentary, he says that at that time he was considering himself sort of retired, which is odd. <laughs> if, you, if you think about... Well, his of, of had that, his yeah. first his first album out yet by the oh, summer of seventy or was it later in seventy? Clapton's first solo album, I think which is getting out. reissued. It, it was out, and um, he was pretty close to. Didn't he? Rec he recorded Layla around the time that George did All Things Must Pass. Yeah, right. Because yeah. I'm wondering because he had been sort of 
Clapton had sort of been kind of turned, I don't know, turned off as the accurate, accurate phrase, but after the experience of Cream, and it sort of happened again with blind faith, he was looking to disappear in a band somewhere, and thus Delaney and gotten in Delaney and Bonnie's band, which started the ball rolling, you know, towards his first solo album. Mm -hmm. To uh, those guys from Delaney and Bonnie's band coming into the old things must pass picture in those sessions. So, um, I mean, it could have still been at a time when Clapton wasn't interested in having the spotlight on him any longer and wanted to just be the guitarist in the background. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then, you know, now with solo albums coming out, um, his first one in 70, and then, you know, it was a few years before 461 Ocean Boulevard came out. He had no choice but to step back in the spotlight tour to support his own music. So, uh, I mean, I don't know. I don't have, I could look it up, the date of the release of Clapton's first solo album, if it was out. It's, it was in early 1970, I think. All right, so it was out. Yeah. Oh, definitely it was out. Yeah. But you know that that new book, All Things Must Pass Away, I'm only halfway through it, but uh, they do a great job in uh, talking about how complicated Derek Clapton was and he kind of had an identity crisis. And kind of like what you said, Darren, you know, he, I guess after the, the Eric Clapton album of 1970, he wanted to be in a band again. He didn't want the spotlight yeah. all on him. Right. So he didn't stay in bands very long. <laughs> no, well, he, um, I mean, the Delaney and Bonnie thing was more towards the end of 69. Yep. And that's how they pushed him out. You got to do your own album. Mm -hmm. uh, you're Eric Clapton. You're not just this guy just playing guitar with us. Right. Um, and uh, again, I was too young. I don't know. Did he tour to support that first solo album? And maybe at that time in the summer of 70, he still was skittish about stepping out and taking the spotlight and wanted to just be in the background and, you know, not kind of tinker with that whole cream blind faith vibe. Right. That, uh, had kind of soured him a bit. But he had recorded Layla or was recording Layla. He was doing it. Yeah, it was time. And, and, you know, they were sort of sharing a band in a way. You know, a lot of the people in, in Derek and the Dominoes were on the All Things Must Pass sessions. Um, and the jams from the All Things, at least some of the jams from the All Things Must Pass, you know, third disc mm -hmm. on LP um, were actually recorded at Derek and the Dominoes sessions. Mm -hmm. um, so it was kind of a, a little fluid thing there, um, but he may not have felt up to singing publicly. I mean, especially if he was having such a hard time getting to New York in the first place um, and having heroin problems. And, you know, and in addition, you know, you have a guy who is very close friends with George and yet who is also madly in love with George's wife. You know, that can't have been that comfortable a situation. I, I, I have no idea how they negotiated that because they stayed friends. You know, he came, he turned up for the concert. They, he played on George's album. Um, and, uh, and yet, you know, that was going on as well, you know, because that's what Layla was about. And I remember, you know, shortly after Layla came out, uh, Clapton did a Rolling Stone interview and it still wasn't known, you know, who Layla was. And I remember him talking to the Rolling Stone interview saying, uh, no, it's about this uh, woman who's, uh, you know, the, the wife of a very close friend and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a horrible situation. And the interviewer said, well, you know, but wouldn't she have been impressed by, you know, the song that you wrote for her, you know, Layla. And he said, uh, you understand her, her old man has written her the most beautiful love songs in the world. <laughs> so, you know, you, you, you think about that and, and you sort of wonder, you know, how, how difficult was it for Clapton to be there, you know, uh, and play this and would he have wanted to, you know, sing on top of it, um, that and the heroin and everything. It, it, I, I, I have a feeling that George probably would have been happy if he did, but he didn't want to. It's just my guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Should we just briefly talk about the differences between the afternoon show and the evening show? Okay. Yeah, that would, that would most, yeah, sure. Okay. One of the biggest differences is that George performed Hear Me Lord. Right. In the afternoon show. It is the only time he ever performed that song. 
-hmm. And I can tell you when I did interview Olivia Harrison, when the DVD came out for the concert for Bangladesh, I brought that up and I said, why hasn't that ever come out? And she just basically said that George wasn't happy with the performance. Mm -hmm. So um, it's kind of sad in a way. It's the only time he ever did that song. Mm -hmm. Um, And also love minus zero, no limit, Mm -hmm. which came out on the, the um, 2005 release of the concert for Bangladesh on CD. Um, that DVD. was done in the afternoon mm-hmm. and the DVD. And um, he didn't perform that in the evening. He substituted Mr. Tambourine Man mm-hmm. in that show. Yeah. And also, um, George changed uh, the set list around because um, something was originally i believe the second song he played that was a song after wawa he moved that up in the evening to the next to last song he moved my sweet lord which i guess was towards the end in the afternoon show he made that the second song Mm -hmm. in the evening show following wawa so you have those differences yeah there are um as you probably know um audience tapes of the afternoon show traveling around Mm. as well um, so you can you can find a copy of that and hear those differences. Yeah, won't be it won't be board quality, but no. Nope. Interesting, yeah. interesting that Dylan uh, swapped out songs, uh, but George just dropped "Hear Me, Lord," and didn't replace mm. it. Did he? No, huh. no. Just cut like you know, dropped the whole song from the. That must must be a tough one though to sing. That's a. There's a lot of things on All Things Must Pass that strike me that they would have been difficult songs to perform live. Mm-hmm. As, as sing, sing them, especially if, if, if he ever thought about, if he ever toured, mm-hmm. that would have been maybe for him, night after night, a tough tour to do with some of the songs, Wah Wah, and, yeah. you know, perform those live a lot, not mm-hmm. just once. Yeah. yeah. Do you think that there was a... Um, given that John and Paul both didn't turn up uh, for their individual reasons, do you think that there was any message in his in George's having started the show with Wawa, which was the song he wrote the day that he walked out of the Let It Be sessions, and has explained that Wawa, in addition to being the Wawa pedal, was was you know meant a headache. You're giving me a headache. Um, and, you know, all that, you know, thinking of you and the things we used to do. Um, do, do you think that, that that he was by then thinking of it as just a song? Or do you think he was uh, um, uh, sort of having a, a sort of a private message to the other two there that the rest of us wouldn't have known at the time? Well, having been so used to it as being the song that he opened with, and it's a great song to open with. It is. And, you know, the, the guitar intro and everything, I think he probably just felt that it was be a good song. to great. It would really, you know, kick off the concert really very powerfully with a song like that. I don't think that was, a, that was intentional as a message. Okay. Darren, you have an opinion? <laughs> I don't know. Okay. I don't think, yeah, I'm not, I don't think so. So have we done it? Um, do you feel yeah. satisfied with you have anything else to add, Ken? Um, yeah, I think I've said almost everything. I, I kind of wish, again, you know, I hate to be critical, but when you watch the DVD, I have a problem with the lighting of the show hmm. because there are those moments when there's when it's very dark. Yeah, and um, they had <clears throat> they had red lights that they used a lot, especially during Billy Preston's song. Mm-hmm. And you kind of wish that it was better lit, you know, more of a white light in some moments. I kind of like the, the red effect on George's hair, <laughs> on the outline of his hair. It looks kind of cool. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, there are those moments when it's a little too dark on, on the stage. So, you know. They came away with um, an iconic photo from that night of Bob Dylan that would end up on the cover of Bob Dylan's Greatest Hits Volume 2, which also sort of like repeated the same sort of look from five years earlier from the first Greatest Hits album. But the shot there's, I guess what, in the booklet, the book that comes with the album, you see Dylan 
and George looking at each other, right? If I remember, mm -hmm. I haven't yep. taken the album out in a while. Uh, mm -hmm. And just Dylan's part, the portion that Dylan was in is uh, the cover of Bob Dylan's Greatest Hits, Volume 2, which came out in 72. Okay. Mm -hmm. You just reminded me, one of my absolute favorite moments of this concert was when Dylan and George and Leon did Just Like a Woman. On one mic? Yeah, and it always reminds me of this boy when John, Paul, and George share one microphone together and how precious that is because they rarely, rarely ever did that. Yeah. So, yeah, I treasure that moment from the concert. That's, that's really, you know, precious. Yeah, there were a me. lot of great moments in that show. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and, and so George would be here. Right. Hi, Bob! <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. So, um, if you haven't um, given the concert for Bangladesh a spin to celebrate its 50th anniversary, um, you might want to do so. It really is worth it. Um, I would, I would say go for the video because there's an awful lot to see. I mean, every time I I watch it, I see things that I hadn't really quite noticed before. Didn't notice, you know, from my seat in the hall. Um, so it's, you know, it, it still sort of pays rewards and uh, give it a watch. So I think we'll go around and uh, give our contact information before we say goodbye. So Ken, start with you. If you'd like to get in touch with me, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. You can always friend me on Facebook at Ken Michaels. Um, I want to mention a few things. Uh, some brand new prizes in the last few weeks that are now possible to win on my website, which is KenMichaelsRadio.com. I have several ways, in fact, to uh, win the new Ram On tribute that we talked about here on the show. Every song from Ram covered here, plus another day and a woman, a why in this uh, CD co-produced by Denny Sywell and Fernando Perdomo. And um, it is one of 10 prizes that you can win as part of my uh, Beatles trivia contest, which I have every single week. And I also have a special contest starting this Wednesday, uh, August the 4th, where you can win Ram on and Ram together. Uh, this is the remastered CD for Ram, the special edition, which has bonus material on it. And uh, the way to win is on my special contest page. It's a contest that lasts for a full week. So if you want to find out about that, visit my website, which is KenMichaelsRadio.com. Not only can you win Ram on on my website, you can now win the book that we just discussed here. All Things Must Pass Away, Harrison Clapton, and other assorted love songs. And uh, like I said, the two authors will be on our show very soon, Ken Womack and Jason Krupa. And I also have, if I can find it, can I find it? I don't know. Here it is. I have no room left in this den of mine. But this is a new book that just came out from John Borak, Beatles 100, 100 Pivotal Moments in Beatle history. And it is just what the title says, important, significant moments that happened to the Beatles in their group years and also their solo years. John also talks about some of his favorite Beatle and solo Beatle songs there. So that's all on my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com. Also on my YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio, I'll give you a chance to win Ram on there with some Ram trivia. And that'll be happening sometime this week. Um, the next Talk More Talk, which is Monday, August the 9th at 9 p.m. Eastern on our Facebook page, we'll be interviewing Ken Womack and Jason Krupa there. So you'll be, you'll be hearing from those two guys quite a lot in our shows. Um, and uh, I do believe that's it. And a reminder that I did interview Alan White from Yes uh, on my YouTube channel, getting a great response from that close to a thousand views so if you can uh check that out of course alan was on all things was Pass, the single for instant karma the imagine album and we talk about all those things uh on my youtube channel all right 
Okay. That's it. DeVivo. And Ken has been um, telling me, you got to come on the, on your YouTube show, which we have talked about possibly this week, recording something. It is very week. possible. I'm hoping. All right. I'm hoping. Okay. Uh, as clearly as you can see, my brain doesn't work anymore. So I forget things. And uh, anyway, I remember this much. If you want to listen to me on WFUV, I'm on the air Monday through Thursday nights, 10 p.m. Uh, is when I get started. And Saturday afternoons, 1 p.m. to 4. Uh, and WFUV is in New York City um, uh, at 90.7 FM. And um, I don't really know if anyone really flips the HD settings on their radio anymore. But if you do, and you're in the tri-state area, 90.7 FM, we have an HD2 channel. Uh, you can listen on our website, WFUV.org. And you can also check us out on our app. So you download that, and it's a handy way to listen to FUV anywhere. Uh, so listen to me there, and you can email me. If you want to send me an email, DarrenDeVivo at WFUV.org. And I have two Facebook pages, um, which one I refer to as Side One, my personal page. Send me a friend request. Uh, or just go over to Side Two, which is more of a um, professional music-oriented page. Not totally, but... And uh, that's uh, Darren DeVivo, WFEV DJ and Beatle podcaster. And follow me there. So that's how you do it. Okay. Um, you can reach me on Facebook, either at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remix, my alter ego. Um, you can contact all of us by email at things we said today radio show at gmail.com. That's Things we said today, radio show, one word at gmail.com. We have a Twitter account and um, we are at Things We Said Fab if you want to send us a DM or something. Um, we also, you know, put links to the shows on Twitter, on Facebook, on, on the Things We Said Today Beatles radio, radio Fans Facebook page and the Things We Said Today Facebook page. Uh, you can also find them on Podbean, YouTube, um, iTunes, and uh, wherever fine podcasts are found. Um, okay, and so um, thanks for joining us for this uh, 50th anniversary commemoration of the concert for Bangladesh. And for Ken Michaels and Darren DeVivo, I'm Alan Cozen saying thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. Take care.